So I guess it's me and Kevin's show this morning. Yeah. 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 Wait a minute, I didn't get your name. I'm BJ. BJ Hilton. BJ. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, BJ. Thank You're you. welcome. Uh -huh. All right, so we're just going to be talking to you guys about some other some little topics that Yolanda has been teaching on for years, and uh, we just kind of feel like they're very important, especially we have a lot of new members in the congregation, and it's it, it's stuff that's just really good to hear it. And Yolanda always says that once you teach it, you know it. So we're proving that we know it. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to start off this morning uh, on a topic about the healing team. Uh, so Melissa, Stacy, and Eden, my wife, are part of the healing team. And so is Melissa's husband and me, Mike and, and me. Uh, so our roles on the healing team, we're all healers. Uh, we all have some kind of medical background, uh, but Mike and I's role on that, and Kevin's role for the music, uh, is shamaring. So what that is, is it's just, uh, the Strong's word is H8104, and it's to keep, to guard, to observe, or to give heed. And that's exactly what we are doing uh, when we're shamaring the atmosphere. So we're keeping that space holy for the Spirit of the Lord to dwell and we're inviting him in, his spirit in, to be present while we work. So, because God's a gentleman, and he's not going to go where he's not invited. So we invite him in, we keep his presence, we keep the, the atmosphere holy, we, we're on guard, kind of. We're guarding it from outside influences, especially those from the enemy. So it gives, you know, distractions come in, and fear comes in, and, and all that in the deliverance session. You know, distractions come in whenever you guys are trying to do your worship. And we just try to keep that, keep that to a minimum. We are observing and watching for what the Holy Spirit wants to show us. You know, that not just things in the physical, but things in the, in the uh, spiritual as well. You know, there may be something that's going on that we can specifically war for in that. Uh, we're giving heed and we're allowing the Holy Spirit to move and work through us and with us. So essentially we're praying in such a way as that we create a safe space for the Spirit of God to operate where words can be given and understood and the enemy and without without the enemy dropping little confusion bombs everywhere Amen. Uh, so when I'm shamaring I can't speak for Mike or Kevin but whenever I'm shamaring I'm usually praying in the spirit the whole time uh, you know I could have my own thoughts at the same time but but I'm praying in the spirit I'm just really letting the, the spirit of God use me for what he needs at that moment uh, be it a word of encouragement or a specific area of the body that needs healing. Uh, so when the deliverance team is going head to head with something, we kind of guard, we're, we're like the rear guard. We're kind of protecting around them so that they don't have to be focused on what they're dealing with head to head and worry about somebody coming up behind them and ambushing them. <clears throat> so we're kind of letting them have that, that you know, ministry right there where we're protecting around them. Uh, where's my space? Oh, uh, so there's a military tactic that I feel really explains this. You know, we, we, we learned from the military, but I believe that ultimately the military learned it from watching God. Yeah. You know, that, that, that took me proven over and over and over again. So there's a military tactic. So when the military locates an area that they need to operate in, they'll first set up a perimeter and they'll control what goes in and out of that perimeter. That's step one is controlling that atmosphere. And that's what we're doing. We want to kick the enemy out and make room for God to, uh, to operate. Uh, so we are using our God-given authority to do that. And when we're controlling the perimeter, it makes it very hard for the enemy to come in and play with our emotions. So uh, the principle doesn't just apply to worship or deliverance sessions. This is something that we all need to be doing every day in our lives. Uh, our social events, our homes, our work, if we make way for the Spirit of God to move with us and before us, I mean, it, it just, it's a game changer. So it, imagine a work day where the enemy can't ambush you. Mm. I mean, that's a, that's a Monday I'm looking forward to. <clears throat> uh, by allowing the Spirit to move and walk with us, we can truly clear a path, so to speak, so that we can complete our works that the Spirit has us here to do. For example, if I find a certain situation that this used to be a really big problem for me was anger. 
you know, there'd be a situation come up and I get so angry and it would just roll into itself and boil over to where I couldn't see past that situation and I couldn't see past the anger. Well, I can't help but think how many, how many opportunities did I miss whenever, you know, I can't see past the anger. How many times to minister did I miss? How many words of encouragement did I not get to give? It just, it, it really changed my life when I started looking at it that way. Uh, it, it just, it keeps you blinded and if, if we can control our atmospheres around us and allow the Spirit to move, it helps us see His fruits and what He's operate wants us to operate in. So love instead of hatred, kindness instead of anger, peace instead of anxiety, and patience instead of rudeness. And as the spiritual head of my household, I feel like it's very important to me, especially what's operating in my home. Uh, so I, I just remember the atmosphere of my house where my wife lives and where my children are growing currently. <laughs> I just, I want the enemy to have no say what happens there. <laughs> only the Lord can operate in our dwelling and only love can, can move in our homes. Uh, and that's, that's one thing that we're very adamant on is we create, we try to create an atmosphere like Yolanda's living room. Has anybody ever been to Yolanda's living room? You, just, you never want to leave. <laughs> it's just awesome. So we're, we're trying to recreate that. Uh, by doing that, uh, so and the, everybody knows this: the the enemy can only he can't create; he can only pervert what God has done. What God has created, he tries to either mimic it. If he can't mimic it; he tries to taint it or destroy it. And I think that anything that brings the Lord joy, the devil just can't stand it. I feel like he tries to attack families. I think this is why marriages are being attacked today. I feel like that's why children are turning away from their parents. And a spoken word to a loved one can be twisted and taken the wrong way that it was never meant. It's never meant to be that. But the enemy knows that there's love and companionship there. So he hates that. He can't stand it because he doesn't have it anymore. He doesn't, get to, he doesn't get that with God anymore and he can't stand it. So he goes in and tries to twist it and manipulate it. Now, I believe that it's important to speak over the atmosphere of our homes and our lives uh, as a first, our first line of offense against the devil. This isn't defensive stuff, guys. This is offense. Amen. This is something that we do first. Uh, I don't run from the devil at my house. I tell him, you have no place here to get out. A uh, good story. Uh, when I was working in Texas, I was 10 hours away from home for two weeks at a time. And we had a pretty good marriage at that time. And the devil chose that time to try to come in and try to run amok. And so Eden... She had demonic attacks. She had, I mean, he didn't come after me. He came after my wife and my house. She couldn't get warm in her own bed. Like that kind of stuff. Wow. Yeah, it was crazy. And it, that's when it finally dawned on me that I had such a physical outlook on this that when I wasn't home, I wasn't protecting home. And the devil took that as a welcome mat to come in because he knew, well, I'm not there. I'm not home. I can't do anything about it. That's not true. I started speaking over my wife, and I started speaking over my house every day. You know, so I made a mental capacity to be in that area of shamaring that atmosphere, even though I wasn't there. Ten hours away, and it would stop. It would stop immediately, almost. So the devil's a legalist. That means if you don't explicitly tell him to stay out of my life and stay out of my affairs, he will come into it because you didn't tell me not to. I can do whatever I want. That's not true. Uh, so guarding the atmospheres around us can help us, one, discern and detect him, and two, it's easier for us to say, all right, get out of here. I've already set up the perimeter. You're not allowed to be here. Uh, Dutch Sheets explained it like this. He says that shamaring the atmosphere is a lot like the old westerns, we know, where they're all behind the, the wagons or the or barrels or something, and one of them's got to go out into the middle to, to go do something, so they'll yell, cover me. So that's what we're doing when we're shamaring the atmosphere. We're covering an area so that people can operate. So when we send you know, evangelists out to go, the house should shamar them so that they're not ambushed out while they're out in the open. We can, kind of, we can cover them while they're operating out in the open. So that's a little bit about shamaring. Uh, and next, I just want to kind of talk about our identities, our kingdom identities. Uh, I love this, this thought. The Holy Spirit kind of gave this to me. Um, when Jesus was baptized by John in the river, he was given his identity by God in a way I wish we all think would happen. We all wish would happen. 
the sky opened and the Lord audibly spoke and said, this is my son who I love. Listen to him. He knows what he's talking about. I mean, that'd be great if, that'd be great if we knew who we were from God's point of view like that. But anyway, it didn't happen like that for me. <laughs> so then he went, from, he went to go prepare for his future tasks by going out into the desert. And once he got to the desert, the devil immediately started coming in and trying to attack that identity that God gave him. Yes. See, I, don't, I believe that the devil no longer has access to the word of God as far as like the spoken word of God. I mean, he's not omnipotent, he's not omnipotent and he's not omniscient. He's not God. He has to hear from God the same way we have to hear from God. That's why when you get a prophecy, the devil hears that too. He's going to be there because he doesn't know it. And as soon as he knows it, he's going to try to start <laughs> taking it away. So your whole messages and, and prophecies on a jar on a shelf, it's important to keep those and guard those. Because if it's a true word of God that he wants to bring you something, the devil's going to try to attack it. Because mm-hmm. he, right. he hates what brings God joy, our prosperity, all of this. He, he can't stand it. So anyway, Jesus goes out to the desert to, be, to prepare for his tasks, and the devil tempts him. If you are the son of God, feed yourself. If you are the son of God, prove it. He'll, like, you could just heal yourself. You know, give, I'll give you all these kingdoms if you'll just bow down to me. Jesus knew his identity. He just got it. Just got it. 40 days ago. Just got it. So if the devil has the gall to attack Jesus' identity, why do we think that we're so secure in our kingdom identities? We're, we're here to change the world just like Jesus did. In Mark 16, 17, and 18, these signs will accompany those who believe. They'll drive out demons, speak in new tongues, pick up snakes with their hands, drink poison that won't hurt them, place their hands on the sick. Like, we're here to change the world just like Jesus did. Mm-hmm. Why do we feel like we're untouchable in our identities? We have to guard that. We have to protect our identities. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit more about just some points about your identity that you may know, you may not know, but it's good stuff. Number one, you have a destiny. So Jeremiah 29, 11, in the New International Version, says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Now, the word that they use for plan there is makashaba. Don't ask me how to spell it. It's spelled in tongues. Uh, <laughs> but it means thought, device, plan, purpose. Now, I love that word. I love purpose there. It's my favorite translation of that word to apply to that verse because it changes it totally. Plan is take four steps forward, turn left, two steps forward, turn right. That's a plan. A purpose is here's where you started, here's where I know where I want you to be. Everything in the middle can be all wibbly wobbly, it doesn't matter. If you fall off the plan, you're off the plan. As long as you make it to your purpose, you've made it to your purpose. That's good. It, it changes it. So if I can paraphrase a little bit, Well, it means that God sat down one day and thought out my life. Not left turn, right turn, but it it just means that he sat down and said, I know where you want you to be. So I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. This isn't in the scripture, but it's just how I take this verse with that word change. Uh, God was saying to his children, I know the purpose I made you for, or why I made you. Your purpose is to be prosperous. Your purpose is to harm the enemy not to be harmed by the enemy. Amen. A purpose filled with hope. Enough hope to share with the whole world forever. Wow. It changes it a little bit. That's a destiny, and that's a reminder of who you are. More on destiny. Back when Paul was Saul, he had an epic destiny to do with the new Christians. From day one. The enemy saw that destiny and tweaked it, knocked it just off balance. Uh, the enemy attacked uh, Paul's, I'm sorry, Saul's identity, twisting it, trying to destroy the new church. He imprisoned and interrogated the church, causing despair. The Holy Spirit showed me just how he did this he, uh, to do the exact opposite of his true anointing. Saul reduced the numbers of the church. He spread fear to the new Christians, causing them to run from him and hide from him. He did everything on, in, in his power using all earthly authority because he got the kings okay to do this. He used all earthly authority to turn the world away from Christianity. But there's a good ending to the story. When he met Jesus on the side of the road, Jesus said, this, is not, this isn't who you're supposed to be. 
in, in lack of better words, he said, this isn't who you're supposed to be. I had a plan. Like, God has a purpose for you. And when that happened, we know his, his kingdom identity was able to be stepped into because it did the exact opposite of what the enemy used. Uh, so he became one of the biggest advocates for the new church. He touched unnumbered lives and changed history. When he stepped into his kingdom identity, there was an amazing transformation. Where there was reduction in numbers, he multiplied the congregation. Where, he, where fear dwelt, he became a pillar of hope, a mobile pillar because he went out to the world and taught hope there. Where there was repression of the teachings of the Messiah, the word of God spread to the nations when he stepped into his identity. Our identities can be hidden from us or even twisted by the enemy. I got good news. We can always take back what the enemy's stolen. Amen. Point number two, you are co-creators. Genesis 2-7, when God breathed into Adam's nostrils, he filled Adam's lungs with his spirit. I always wondered why God chose the nose. I, that's the way I think. I read the scripture. I'm like, that's weird. Why, why are you breathing in the nose? Then it dawned on me. He filled him through the nose with the spirit because whenever you fill, say if you had air going up your nose, it would fill your lungs. And then where does it go? Back out the mouth. So man's first action on this earth was to release the spirit of God. <laughs> I mean, that's... That's why he did it that way. Uh, so he released the Holy Spirit through the, into the atmosphere through his mouth. We're designed to be co-creators with God and literally speak things forth and set things into motion. God gave us angels to help us do this. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 1 in the Passion Translation says, uh, 1, 13 and 14, God never said to any of his angels, take your seat next to me at my right hand until I force your whispering enemies to be a rug under your feet. So then what role do the angels have? If they're not supposed to just sit there with God up in heaven, what are they doing? Well, they're messenger spirit, or they're spirit messengers sent by God to serve those who are going to be saved. Mm -hmm. So when we speak a blessing, it's the angels that carry that blessing forth. Uh, in Matthew 26, 51 and 53, through 53, uh, I love this because... Uh, it, it's where they're in the Garden of Gethsemane, and one of his disciples pulled out a dagger and swung it at the servant of the high priest, slashing off his ear. And Jesus said to him, Put away your dagger, for those who embrace violence will die by violence. Don't you realize that I could ask my heavenly Father for angels to come at any time to deliver me? Any time. All I have to do is say the word and they'll be here. He'll send me 12 angelic armies and an angelic host to come and protect us. Not, not just Jesus, us. Like, he, we have the ability to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was, so Jesus saw what was happening in the spirit, but he, it, and it was affecting what was happening on the physical. I'm sure he wasn't happy that the first action of his disciples was violence. I'm sure he wasn't happy that, you know, first things cut off an ear. But he used it as a teaching moment. He saw what was happening. Uh, you cannot solve a spiritual problem with a physical solution. Amen. It can't be done. Uh, whatever needs to be brought forth or changed in the spirit has to be dealt with in the spirit. Then, as always, the result uh, manifests in the physical. So I believe we command angel squadrons sent to this earth to help us bring the kingdom to the uh, third heaven to earth. So Adam was created in the family of God to steward and co-create with God. Uh, when Adam named this creature a tiger, it was. He named it. God didn't, he didn't like, oh, I'm going to send this up to God. God's going to vote with the angels. Yes, that's a good name. Send it back down. God gave Adam that authority. When, when he said this is a tiger, he gave it his identity. And that's co-creation. We are also co-miracle workers with Christ. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We all know this verse, and many of us use it to remind ourselves daily that we're never alone because we have God with us, we have Christ with us. Uh, and in G with Jesus, we can do anything. But did you know there's a step one to that verse? And it's actually the verse right before it, Philippians 4.12. The Passion Translation puts it this way, uh, I know what it means to lack, and I know what it means to experience overwhelming abundance. For I am trained in the secret of overcoming all things. 
Then it goes on to say, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. But I, he's trained. He's trained in the secret of all things. So we have to be training ourselves be, before we can manifest that. That's good. So how do we train ourselves? Unfortunately, I can't tell you that. Every, each of us have our own walk with all three of the Godhead. We have our own walk. It's all to different destinations, and they're all different lengths. But I can tell you a good place to start. Uh, so number one, we must be willing to surrender to the Spirit of God. Uh, only by learning to hear and trust the teacher that Jesus sent us can we start our journey and end up where we were designed to be. Number two, stop comparing yourselves to other people. <coughs> Chris Ballatin from Bethel has a, has a great quote, and I love it. He said, when I get to heaven, God's not going to ask me, why weren't you Moses? I fear he might ask me, why weren't you Chris? <clears throat> God didn't create you to be somebody else because he already created that person. He created you to be you because he needs you to be you. He needs you to hear the way you hear. He needs you to speak the way you speak. He needs you to do things the way you do things. That's why he created you to be you. So the devil will come in and say, well, you're not as good as them because you can't do that like they do. You weren't meant to do like that like they do. You were meant to be you. <laughs> Number three, start the deliverance process. Either through self-deliverance via books or tapes or through formal deliverance team. We as the children of God must be set free from the influence of the enemy. God made an example of this when he liberated his children time and time again throughout the Old Testament. Uh, from Moses to the days of Daniel, he made it known that uh, uh, he knew his children must be free. Today, the enemy doesn't physically enslave or oppress us as he did in Old Testament times. Today, he uses spiritual warfare to bring us down, uh, knowing that it will manifest here. So the, basically, in a nutshell, the enemy is using things in the spirit that's going to come down to you as a physical problem. Sorry, I lost my place. Oh, but we have the tools that he's given us, like the blood, to apply it to our lives and begin the deliverance process. Starts you to help. Starts begins to help you learn your authority and your spiritual identity. Number four, we have to be a good steward. Adam was a steward. We are the sons of Adam, sons and daughters of Adam. We also have to be good stewards. Uh, begin telling everything in your sphere of influence and authority that sins are forgiven. Romans 8, 19 and 20, the entire universe is standing on tiptoe, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. For against its will, the universe has had to endure the empty futility resulting from the consequences of human sin. But now, with eager expectation, all creation longs for freedom coming to God's children. To this day, we are aware of the universal agony and groaning as if it were in contractions of labor for childbirth. So that's that's what the that's what our everything around us is doing. It's groaning under that weight of sin. So another one of those moments where I read the scripture, I'm like, well, why is that? So why would creation be waiting so impatiently? Like they're on tiptoe. Like, come on, hey, let's go. They're waiting for us to do this, to clean up this sin and this weight. Why is it doing that? They're waiting impatiently for us to be set free because it knows that once God's children are free, it's next. Amen. We're first. We're, we're, the, we're the firstborn. Like, I mean, as far as authority, we're the firstborn, and then the creation's next. That's why it's waiting. The devil, devil hates everything that brings God's joy. Yeah, God's, yeah, brings God joy, like his children or creation. So it stands to reason why, like why he wouldn't stop oppressing one or the other. God doesn't, or I'm sorry, the devil doesn't just hate us. He hates creation. He hates everything God did. He wants that blade of grass to be sitting under sin and wait forever. Why? Because God created it. And it was supposed to bring God joy. We are partners. Well, I, oh well one more note. Uh, I'm looking forward to the day that a rock can minister to me. Because <laughs> imagine everything it's heard and seen since Genesis 1 1. I cannot wait for that. <laughs> We are partners with the Holy Spirit. Uh, anything the Spirit can do, it can be done through us and with us. Jesus gave us the best gift in the entire universe. He said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another Savior 
Another word would be comforter, teacher, defender. The literal translation in the Greek, defense attorney. I want, I want the Holy Spirit as my defense attorney up in heaven. That's all I'm saying. Uh, the Holy Spirit of truth, who will be to you a friend just like me. And he will never leave you, and the world won't receive him because they can't see him or know him. But you will know him intimately, because he will make his home in you, and he will reside in you. So get to know and learn from him. He's also the best friend you'll ever have. And helps me pick out anniversary gifts when I'm late. And like, It's great. It truly is the best. <laughs> Told me right where to go, the best piece of jewelry I've ever seen. Uh, we are loved. And I'm going to tell you how much you're loved. We have such a good daddy. So we all, we all know that, right? So the, the word father is used so much in the King James Version, but most of the time it, it can be translated to Abba which is a uh, term of endearment, and it means closer to daddy. Father's strict. Father's like, mm, you're grounded, and why aren't your grades up? Which is true, and it happens sometimes, and it's deserved. But a daddy's a daddy. Daddy is our daddy. And he's such a good daddy. He bends over heaven's balcony to check in on you. That's in Psalms 14.2. He knows your name. That's Isaiah 43.1. You cannot be separated from his love. That's Romans 8, 39. His love for you is immeasurable, and he truly loves who you are. That's Ephesians 3, 18 and 19. You're shielded by his love, so he wraps his love around you to protect you. That's how much he loves you. That's Psalms 5, 11 and 12. His love for you never fails. That's Psalms 36. He didn't wait for you to repent before he sent his son to die for you. Amen. He sent him as you were because he knew the purpose he had for you. What I, I love this verse. This is, I don't have it written on here. It's Psalms 3018, I think. Don't quote me on that. But I can get it for you later. Uh, what a God you are. Your path for me has been perfect. All your promises have proven true. What a secure shelter for all those who turn to hide themselves in you. You are a wrap around God giving grace to me. The Passion Translation translates the word shield as wraparound 16 times in Psalms. That's 16 times your daddy just wants to hug you. We are his ecclesia. Ecclesia is Strong's G1577. What it means is a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public place, an assembly. So we are an assembly of people convened in a public place of the council for the purpose of deliberating. We're called out into the world together as the body to do what is commissioned of us. So the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Now go in my authority and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to faithfully follow what all I've commanded. But the most important part of the commission, and never forget that I am with you every day, even to the completion of this age. Well, you know, we hear the first part of it is, oh, we got to go out into the world. But we always forget the second part. God is with us. Amen. We were never meant to do this alone. Just like God made Eve for Adam, and where two or more agree, every joint supplies, we have the Father, and we have the Spirit, and we have Jesus with us. Amen. So we are the government of God. So how do we overthrow a government of the enemy if we ourselves are disoriented and scattered? As the bride of Christ, we must learn and understand and assume our role as the authoritative, heavenly, and govern, earthly governing body of God. The devil's acts are, in fact, treason against the government of God. So number seven, you're healers. We are called to lay hands on the sick and see them healed. Number eight, we are hope to the hopeless. We spread hope to those who cannot see past the enemy's blinders. Number nine, we, support, we are support to the fallen. We rise up as the bride of Christ to help those in need. The Bible says you are holy, wonderful, majestic, glorious, desirable, delightful, courageous, pursued, renewed, known, saved, cleansed, strengthened, helped, upheld, exalted, chosen, redeemed, a family member, a temple, a wineskin, never alone, called, fully supplied, inseparable, an ambassador, victorious, powerful, blessed, an heir to heaven, and adopted. And you are so much more. 
Has anyone told you how awesome you are today? <laughs> Thank you. Pacing. <laughs> you can pace all you want. Well, I don't know, but the more I pace, the more this will be keeping me loose a little bit. Uh, interesting, some of your choices of scripture. <laughs> one of them made me chuckle. Um, uh, it's not unusual for me to be awake in the middle of the night, um, whether it's the bladder or one of the kids. Uh, and occasionally I wake up and I just feel like being, I need to be up and praying. And uh, not every time I'm awake is that the case, but sometimes it is. <laughs> and what made me chuckle is that uh, here a couple weeks ago, I, I woke up in the middle of the night and uh, felt like I needed to be up and praying. I didn't know about what, but I needed to be up and praying. And I just, I'd had trouble getting to sleep that night. I hadn't, I hadn't slept well. I just, in my mind, I just, I just can't. I just, I just physically can't get up and pray. <laughs> The Lord speaks to me through the numbers on the clock often. When I, when I wake up in the middle of the night, I rolled over and the clock was 4.13. <laughs> I can do all things through Christ. You strengthen me. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, you, you read 12 uh, in uh, The Passion, but uh, I just want to read that, the end of that, the 13 in The Passion, because it, it, I just found it interesting. And I find that the strength of Christ's explosive power infuses me to conquer every difficulty. And it's, well, um, Yolanda asked, asked us to, to speak here the last time she was gone, so it would have been a month, month ago when we had all the ice and snow. And uh, we met for lunch, uh, BJ and I and, and Mike as well, and talked about what we were sensing the Lord leading us in, and so we talked a little bit then. And, BJ and I talked just a little bit the other day, and I was kind of wondering, you know, is this kind of on the same page? Is it not? It kind of feels like it's connected, but kind of not. And as BJ was speaking, I kind of got this picture like we were kind of coming at the same thing, but maybe from different angles. So I got this picture of a kind of a left right. So we're, <laughs> we're going to battle against the enemy. And, and I also thought on the way here, it's kind of a little bit of basic training, some, some things we just need to touch on, kind of get us thinking about, uh, about some things. Um, and uh, anyway, <clears throat> I'll get started. So, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, starting in verse 11, says this And he has appointed some with grace to be apostles, and some with grace to be prophets, and some with grace to be evangelists, some with grace to be pastors and some with grace to be teachers. And their calling is to nurture and prepare all the holy believers to do their own works of ministry. And as they do this, they will enlarge and build up the body of Christ. These grace ministries will function until we all attain oneness into the faith, until we all experience the fullness of what it means to know the Son of God. And finally, we become one into a perfect man with the full dimensions of spiritual maturity and fully developed into the abundance of Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm thankful to be in a place <clears throat> that recognizes. This is what when we get the idea of the fivefold ministry. We you hear us talk about fivefold ministry. And I'm thankful to be in a place where those aspects of ministry are recognized because I have been in places where they have not. I have been in, in houses, in churches, where from the leadership, it the idea was prophets are from Old Testament. We don't have prophets today. Prophecy is for the Old Covenant. We're in the New Covenant now. And I've been in places where I've, I've heard it said by leadership, apostles were those who walked with Jesus on this earth. And there are no apostles in this day and age. But yet, I read the scripture and it says... These grace ministries will function until we all attain oneness into the faith, until we all experience the fullness of what it means to know the Son of God. So I, do, I have trouble reconciling no prophecy and no apostles when I don't feel like we've all come into that oneness into faith, right? 
So I want to talk about one of these areas this morning. Um, I have of late been challenged a bit to the idea of being a pastor. And as I've looked into that, what is a pastor? And <clears throat> the people who have challenged me in this are not here today. Um, one of them may be, uh, have the initials of Yolanda McCune. <laughs> but she likes to kind of poke you and, 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 and challenge you. Um, but as I've looked at this idea of being a pastor, I realized that I'm not really sure fully what it means to be a pastor. What, it, what does it mean to pastor somebody? And I think that's because I've been trained for so long as to what a pastor is supposed to be, and it's a completely messed up definition. Um, you know, we look at my church background, um, what a pastor was, how you determined who the pastor was, how you find a pastor. You know, the, my experience was when there was a pastor position open, what do you do? You form a committee, you take in resumes, you look over the resumes, what's their, what's their experience? Were they a youth pastor? Were they a, did they go to seminary? And then you send the team out, they go and listen to him teach. Then you invite them in and they, they teach, you know, on Sunday morning, they, they talk, you know, what's your, what's your uh, goals? How do you plan to reach the community? And so I thought we kind, of, we kind of choose a pastor based on their ability to teach and evangelize, but then we get upset and you hear people complain when, well, they don't have regular hospital visitations. You know, you know I, uh, if you've been around a lot of churches, you, you hear that. So we, we, we choose them based on their ability to teach and, and evangelize, but then we complain when they're not a good pastor. <clears throat> so what and, and then because we, we expect the pastor um, of our churches to be a good teacher we expect them to be a good evangelist we even maybe expect them to um, be a bit of a prophet but in my church background we didn't we didn't talk about prophets yeah. we didn't have prophets but we kind of wanted them and we wanted them to sort of be apostolic in their leadership but we wouldn't we're not going to call them apostles. And we wanted them to be a pastor. So we put all this weight on one individual. Mm -hmm. In my background, one man, because you can't have a woman pastor. And that's a, that's a soapbox for another day. <laughs> we put all that weight on one individual and then wonder why, you know, pastors are getting out of the ministry left and right. Mm -hmm. So as I was thinking about this, what is a pastor? I got to thinking about uh, those other of the five-fold ministry. And if you think about it this way, that the prophet kind of represents the voice of God, speaking out the word of God. And the teacher, it's kind of the knowledge, the knowledge of God. The evangelist represents the feet of God, always pursuing God after those who, who are lost, pursuing those who are wandering. And then the apostle kind of is the, the wisdom and the hands of God kind of orchestrating all the pieces of the puzzle. What's the pastor? To me, the pastor represents the heart of the Father. Mm -hmm. You know? And kind of, I thought, even kind of like the lap of the Father. Like, come here. Have a seat. Let's, let's talk. Let's talk about this for a second. You messed up, but that's okay. What can we learn from this? Or what can I do to help you on your path? That's to me kind of what, what, what the pastor kind of represents of God. <clears throat> so as I was thinking about this, another time when I was up in the middle of the night, I was pondering this, contemplating what, what I was going to speak over um, and this idea that, that this idea of pastor is, is kind of mixed up for us. And I thought, well, why? Why is it, why is it that pastor is, is, we get this kind of wrong idea of what a pastor should be. And obviously part of it is because 
it's all those five pieces have to work together so that so that we will all come into that fullness that the body of Christ will be in that fullness but I, pond, I just threw this question now not really hey God why is it that just huh I wonder why that is just pondering well it came to me the next morning I think and I thought well, Jesus Jesus is our savior Jesus Jesus came to walk this earth to be an example to us and to walk and, and to be that perfect sacrifice for us. His very nature is being relatable, relational. And Holy Spirit is our helper, as BJ was talking about, you know, our advocate, our, our, uh, our defense attorney. Um, by very nature, Holy Spirit is relational. He indwells us. <clears throat> but Father God is kind of distant for us. Thanks in large part because of Greek philosophy that we have allowed into Christianity. Um, this idea that God is somewhere way up there and we're way down here. Um, it's almost like we have a picture, some of us maybe, that God is up there, he's got his binoculars in hand, you know, and he's got a bucket of lightning bolts just ready to, you know, <laughs> lash them down on us when we, when we mess up. But I hope not, I hope not yeah. <laughs> but then I thought about the Old Testament. The heroes of the faith, you know, Moses and Abraham. They didn't really have the same understanding of Jesus as we do. And Holy Spirit was kind of a, in for a, a purpose and at, a, at a specific time so they didn't really have the understanding of Holy Spirit indwelling them like we do mm-hmm. but what they did know is they knew Father God who walked in the cool of the day in the garden mm-hmm. that's what they knew so they knew God as relational so pastor so if the pastor represents the Father's heart. Why is it so important that we build up and understand and and begin to walk as a body in the idea of pastoring people? It's because we need people to understand the Father's heart, to walk with Father God. Why? Well, BJ touched on it already this morning. What do we get from our fathers? Identity. We have to walk with with Father, we have to relate to Father, we have to be in touch with the Father's heart so that we understand our identity because we do get our identity from our earthly fathers, but our heavenly Father has our perfect identity, mm-hmm. our redeemed identity. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. Just think about. <coughs> Actually, I pondered this week, and, and maybe I'm completely off. Um, maybe I'm not. As we look at churches today, um, this. it seems to me that women as a whole tend to relate maybe a little easier to Jesus than men do. Let's see if I can get this, get this thought out here. Okay, guys, speaking to you men, we absolutely need to understand how to be the bride of Christ. Amen. Yes. And we absolutely need to understand how to walk in tune with Holy Spirit and move and flow with Holy Spirit. But I think at times men maybe don't get that as easily as women do. And so my thought was this week, maybe if we did a better job of pastoring in the church, of true pastoring, what pastors should be, not this Greek whatever idea that we have, that maybe men would relate to the church a little better as they understand Father and they connect that with what they know as being a man, as being a loving father, as being a the strength being a, a protector, as BJ talked about, shamari, 
being a provider, maybe that might connect more with men. Like I said, maybe I'm wrong, but something in there it seems like there's something there. I need to I need to think about more. So anyway, as we think about Father, <clears throat> when when Yolanda first uh, asked us to speak, one thing that came to mind, um, and one thing that's been churning ever since, was a, a story, a, a parable that I'm sure you're very familiar with. Um, find it. I can't talk and think about where stuff is in Scripture at the same time. <clears throat> very familiar with. Uh, probably if you're like me, you grew up referring to this parable as the parable of the prodigal son. And I think it's important for what I'm sharing this morning because as we talk about the heart of Father, this is a parable where Jesus is telling a story about a father. You know, uh, Jesus was asked, you know, show us the father. And Jesus said, how long have I been with you? Mm-hmm. Don't you know if you've seen the father? You've, I mean, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. I and the father are, are one. Mm-hmm. So Jesus knew all about the father. And he shares his story so that we can better understand um, father. We call this often the prodigal son. But Jesus starts it out like this. Once there was a father. Amen. Once there was a father. We get focused on mm-hmm. the one son and how yeah. he wandered off. And, then, and obviously at the end, it's you know, the father's love that brings him back in. But the key, the key point of this story is the father. There once was a father with two sons. The younger son came to the father and said, Father... Don't you think it's time to give me the share of your estate that belongs to me? I've heard it thought before that essentially what he was doing was saying, Dad, I I want what's mine, what's coming to me, and you haven't died yet. So I'd really just, I mean, since you're not dead yet, could you, so he's essentially saying, I kind of wish you were dead, Dad. The younger son came to the father and said, Father, don't you think it's time to give me the share of your estate that belongs to me. So the father went ahead and distributed among the two sons their inheritance. Now that's something that caught me for the very first time. I had never seen. I actually went and checked several different translations and they all say the same thing and I had missed it for the first, you know, 40 some years of my life. The father distributed among the two sons. He split up the inheritance. We'll get back to that in a little bit. Shortly afterward, the younger son packed up all his belongings and traveled off to see the world. He journeyed to a far-off land where he soon wasted all he was given in a binge of extravagant and reckless living. With everything spent and nothing left, he grew hungry, for there was a severe famine in the land. So he begged the farmer in that country to hire him. The farmer hired him and sent him out to feed the pigs. Now that's a a job of aspiration for a, a young Jewish man. The son was so famished, he was willing to even eat the slop given to the pigs because no one would feed him a thing. Humiliated, the son finally realized that he was doing what he he was doing, and he thought, there are many workers at my father's house who have all the food they want and plenty to spare. They lack nothing. Why am I here dying of hunger, feeding these pigs and eating their slop? I want to go back home to my father's house. And I'll say to him, Father, I was wrong. I have sinned against you. I'll never be worthy to be called your son. Please, Father, just treat me like one of your employees. So the young son set off for home. From a long distance away, his father saw him coming, dressed as a beggar, and great compassion swelled up in his heart for his son who was returning home. So the father raced out to meet him. He swept him up in his arms, hugged him dearly, and kissed him over and over with tender love. Then the son said, Father, I was wrong. I have sinned against you. I could never deserve to be called your son. Just let me, the father interrupted and said, Son, you're home now. Turning to his servants, the father said, Quick, bring me the best robe, my very own robe, and I will place it on his shoulders. Bring the ring, the seal of sonship, and I will put it on his finger. 
and bring out the best shoes you can find for my son. Let's prepare a great feast and celebrate. For this beloved son of mine was once dead, and now he's alive again. Once he was lost, but now he is found, and everyone celebrated with overflowing joy. Now the older son was out working in the field when his brother returned, and as he approached the house, he heard the music of celebration and dancing. So he called over one of the servants and asked, What is going on? The servant replied, It's your younger brother. He's returned, and your father is throwing a party to celebrate his homecoming. The older son became angry and refused to go in and celebrate. <clears throat> so his father came out and pleaded with him, Come and enjoy the feast with us. The son said, Father, listen, how many years have I been working as a slave for you, performing every duty you've asked as a faithful son, and I've never once disobeyed you. But you've never thrown a party for me because of my faithfulness. Ne never once have you even given me a goat that I could feast on and celebrate with my friends like he's doing now. But look at this son of yours. He comes back after wasting your wealth on prostitutes and reckless living. And here you are throwing a great feast to celebrate for him. The father said, my son, you're always by my side. Everything I have is yours to enjoy. It's only right to celebrate like this and be overjoyed because the brother of yours, this brother of yours was once dead and gone, but now he's alive and back with us again. He was lost, but now he's found. So yeah, the father's love. Like I said, as I look at the story, I realize there's two, two sons here and neither one knew what their identity was. Neither one of them truly knew who they were in the Father's love. There are two, <laughs> there are two people that have ever walked this, ever walked this earth who could call me dad. And there are certain rights there are certain responsibilities that come with that. And I want them to understand what they have as being a part of my family. And I want, to understand, want them to understand how loved they are. So look at this story. Like I said, the father split up the wealth. He gave what, this son into this son. But even at the end of the story, the other son, the older son, still refers to that as your wealth. He didn't know what he had. He didn't know the blessings that he had to begin with. He didn't understand that what the father had was his as well. Um, and that's what the father wants you to understand. You know, BJ touched on it so much this morning, just what our authority is and what our, our, uh, what our identity is in walking um, with the father. But nothing that the other sons or the younger sons said ever changed the father. Even when he said, Dad, I wish you were dead so that I could have what's coming to me. It still never changed the fact that it was his son. Um, you've heard it before him, and he's a long way off when he sees him coming. And he's just overwhelmed with love for his son. It, he, he wasn't, it didn't offend him that his son asked for his piece of the wealth because in the father's eyes it was already his mm -hmm. it didn't offend him that he said dad I wish you were dead because no matter anything he said just like my kids nothing they can do nothing they can say will change the fact that I love them mm -hmm. um, becoming a father changed my idea of love it opened up love in a whole different level mm -hmm. you know you know, I've chosen to love my wife and, and that grows through, you know, through the years, but there's something different about when it's your kid, right? It's like, they're not there and then they're there and you can't explain it, but you just, you just love them. With, with, and nothing can change that. It's just, it's a, it's hard to explain it, uh, but it's just, it's amazing. And that's the way Father God loves us, you know? Nothing we can do changes that. Read some scriptures about this and kind of tie it back around. <clears throat> the 
sometimes things flow in my head and then they, they just get stopped. <laughs> the fact that I'm up here is, is, is speaking as, you know, that idea of being a pastor. Uh, I was going to say earlier, I had, I had at, at times wondered if I was being called into the ministry. We hear that in church a lot of times, called into the ministry, called into the ministry. Well, we're, Heads up, we're all called into ministry. <laughs> but this idea of like vocational ministry um, is, is you're in is you're in a lot of churches. You kind of you kind of go from being a lay person to if you if you study a little harder, you you, you get a little deeper in your spiritual walk. Well, then they, maybe they'll give you a small group for the children's, or maybe they'll make you a Sunday school teacher, and eventually. Um, Again, in my background, in another soapbox, if you're a man, you can become a deacon. And then, you know, then, well, if you're, and this is, this is not to brag, if you, if you walk more deeply in your faith, it doesn't take very long before you realize that you have progressed beyond a lot of people in the church. And that's not something I'm bragging about. That's something to say, that's a sad state we're in. So that a lot of people just sitting in the church as observers, um, and especially men. Uh, back to my point about maybe we need to learn how to pastor so we can learn to get in touch with men. Um, so where was I going? <coughs> um, I totally went blank. But let's look at some scriptures about being children, sons of God. I think uh, BJ's actually touched on a few of these. Because I think what the heart of the Father really is, and that's what I was getting at earlier, there are things I want my children to know. I want them to know who they are. And I want them to know they're loved. And that's what the Father's heart is for us. He wants you to know who you are, that identity you can walk in. He wants you to know that you are loved more than anything. Romans. Eight. We'll look at. Let's start at. We'll look at fourteen. And some of this, as that BJ has already touched on, the mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. You did not receive the spirit of religious duty, leading you back into the fear of never being good enough, but you have received the spirit of full acceptance. I believe some translations say full sonship. Enfolding you into the family of God. You are in a family. And you will never feel orphaned. For as he rises up within us, our spirits join him in saying the words of tender affection. Beloved Father. For the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us as he whispers into our innermost being. You are God's Beloved children. And since we are his true children, we qualify to share all the treasures, all his treasures, sorry. For indeed, we are heirs of God himself. And since we are joined to Christ, we also inherit all that he is and all that he has. We will experience being co glorified with him, provided that we accept his suffering as our own. You're part of a family. We are co-heirs with Christ. All that he has, all the treasures he has, we share in. Galatians. Find it here. Galatians 4. Verses starting verse 3, so it is with us. When we were juveniles, we were enslaved under the hostile spirits of the world. But when that era came to an end, and the time of fulfillment had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the written law. Yet all of this was so that we would redeem, all of this was so that he would redeem and set free all those held hostage hostage to the written law so that we would receive our freedom and full legal adoption as his children. 
and so that we would know for sure that we are his true children, God released the spirit of sonship into our hearts, moving us to cry out in intimately, my father, you are true father. Now we're no longer living like slaves under the law, but we enjoy being God's very own sons and daughters. And because we're his, we can access everything our father has, for we are heirs of God through Jesus the Messiah. The older son, he was kind of trapped in that old law, that old mindset. He was living as a slave. But we are not bound by that law. We are true, true children of God. And one last scripture here. I'm going to tie it up as to why this is all important. Why do we need to know our identity? BJ touched on this already. Why do we need to know we are loved? Romans chapter 8. Verse 31. So, what does all this mean? If God is determined to stand with us, tell me, who then could ever stand against us? For God has proved his love by giving us his greatest treasure, the gift of his Son, and since God freely offered him up as a sacrifice for us, he certainly won't withhold from us anything else he has to give. Okay? Get that? He gave us the biggest, the best treasure that he had. Why would he withhold anything else? Who then would dare to accuse those whom God has chosen in love to be his? Well, I can tell you who would dare to accuse. There's one who would dare to accuse. God himself is the judge who has issued his final verdict over, us, over them, over us, not guilty. Who then is left to condemn us? Certainly not Jesus, the anointed one, for he gave his life for us. And even more than that, he has conquered death and is now risen, exalted, and enthroned by God at his right hand. So how could he possibly condemn us since he is continually praying for our triumph? Who could ever separate us? from the endless love of God's anointed one. Absolutely no one. And this translation has got an exclamation, exclamation point. So absolutely no one. For nothing in the universe has the power to diminish his love toward us. Troubles, pressures, problems are unable to come between us and heaven's love. What about persecutions, deprivations, dangers, and death threats? No, no. For they are all, I like the way that this puts this, they are all impotent, impotent to hinder omnipotent love. <laughs> Even though it is written, all day long we face death threats for your sake, God. We are considered to be nothing more than sheep to be slaughtered. Yet even in the midst of all these things, we triumph over them all. For God has made us to be more than conquerors. More than conquerors. What's more than conquerors? Rulers. 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 That's right. More than conquerors. And his demonstrated love is our glorious victory over everything. So now I live with the confidence that there is nothing in the universe with the power to separate us from God's love. I'm convinced that his love will triumph over death. Life's troubles, fallen angels, or dark rulers in the heavens. There is nothing in our present, nothing in our future circumstances that can weaken his love. There is no power above us or beneath us, no power that could ever be found in the universe that can distance us from God's passionate love, which is lavished upon us through our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One. So, Sometimes I kind of wander, kind of get off. Sometimes my thoughts are kind of scattered and I try to get them all on paper, so, but try to get them out in a coherent way. 
But the key takeaways I want you to have this morning um, are that Father God has a perfect identity for you. He created you. He knit you together. And when he did, he said, this is what you are. And we need to get in touch with the heart of the Father. We need to walk with him daily. We need to understand that he loves us more than anything. That we can learn to walk in our true identity. Um, I didn't write down the scripture, but you spoke on it. You, you mentioned it where creation longs to see God's children walk in their true identity. And so it started out with pastors, but each one of us, each one of us has the ability to prophesy. Each one of us has the ability to teach somebody, to evangelize. Now, we may not be called to like an office of prophet, an office of pastor, but we should each be striving to look and see where, where can we touch? Where does God want to use me in this moment? Where can I be pastoring? Um, because that's where I think will really help people understand that they have a loving father. Um, I put on this necklace. I was trying to decide... Uh, I have a bracelet that Patricia made for me. It's it's chain mail, and I wear it a lot of times because it's like it's the worship team. We're like Judy going first. We're warring, and I, and I I didn't wear it this morning. I was like, well, what what should I wear? And this is a necklace that uh, uh, my in laws gave me for Christmas, and it has the Lord's Prayer on it. And I'm like, I'm supposed to? Well, maybe I am. And then I thought about the words of the Lord's Prayer. This is Jesus teaching us how to pray. And how does he teach us how to pray? By starting out by saying, our Father. Yes. Our Father. Um, cry out to your daddy. Cry out to your daddy. Yes. We, need to, we need to be in touch with the heart of God. Amen. The heart of the Father. Um, we need to realize that he is relational. He wants... <laughs> Why were we created? Why did he put us in the garden? Because he longed for family. He longed to have sons and daughters. He loved his time of walking in the cool of the day. I think he looked forward to it each day. To just in the cool of the day. So Adam, tell me what's going on. What have you named today? What have, you, what have you seen, you know, and just mm -hmm. to hear him talk. Just like, uh, just like our earthly sons and daughters, when, you know, we get so busy sometimes. They're like, okay, we got to like focus on, okay, I, I need to spend time and listen. You think it'd be so easy and then you get busy and, and it gets easy to get distracted. But God doesn't get distracted. When you crawl up in your father's lap, and you say, God, this is what I saw when I was reading your word. You might as well be Adam. You might as well be the only person on this earth. <clears throat> and you're there on his lap. He wants that. He longs for that relationship with you. So, your father loves you. You have an identity. Um, Part of pastoring, I think, is also shamari. As a as pastoring, you kind of you've heard shepherding the flock used as a term for pastoring. Well, what does a shepherd do? He keeps an eye out for the sheep. You know, he shamars. He shamars. Uh, so how how do you pastor? How should you pastor? Do you know? your identity from Father. Do you understand, first off, how much you are loved? If you don't know that, then that's something we need to work on. What is, what is standing in the way of understanding Father's love for you? Um, and deliverance 
You know, what walls are in the way? What walls have been put up, whether by you or by others, that keep you from experiencing and feeling, knowing the Father's love? Uh, if you don't understand that, trust his word, first of all. Read the words of scripture and know that he loves you and just keep telling yourself, he loves me. And Father, show me what is in the way of me experiencing that love in its fullness. So, uh, I could possibly ramble on for a while, but I, I won't. I just want to make sure that there's nothing else. <clears throat> nothing else. I think that's it. So let me pray. Father, Father God, we love you and we know that you, you love us. If we don't always feel it, we can read your word and we can trust your word and we can trust your heart that you love us more than, more than we even know, more than life itself. Because you, you sent your son to give up his life that we would know how much you love us. That we could become victorious sons and daughters. Father, if there are things that are in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds, that stand in the way of us experiencing your love, reveal those to us. Help us know what it is and how to defeat it, how to ask for help. Maybe we need help. Maybe we need help seeing what's in the way. Help us be humble and know that it is so important for us to understand our identity, so important for us to understand your love, that we have to get those things out of the way. Father, how can we be better at pastoring? Each one of us has the opportunity to come alongside somebody else, help them on their journey to understand your love. Help them on their journey to understand what you have created them for and to be. Open our eyes. Get us, get us away from being so focused on ourselves that we don't see what's going on around us. That we miss opportunities to shamar. We miss opportunities to express your love, to be your heart to the world around us. Father, thank you for loving us. <clears throat> thank you for creating us not just to be ants wandering about feeding ourselves, going about life, uh, searching for the next meal, searching for uh, <clears throat> our needs, but you created us to be sons and daughters, to walk with you, to walk with each other. And we thank you for that. Thank you that you loved us so much you gave us the choice to love you. And you gave us a choice to love each other. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We pray your kingdom come. It sure will be done in this place this morning. We love you in Jesus' name. <laughs>
This is where you've heard. You've heard a pastor's heart and a teaching. This is directly from Father's heart to you. So receive from Father's heart this morning.
has no power above us or beneath us. No power that could ever be found in the universe that can distance us from God's passionate love. If you know nothing leaving here today, know that. Nothing separates you from the love of your Father. I just speak once more over you today. The Lord bless you. And keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Gracious to you. I had a mental picture of the little kid crawling up on daddy's lap and grabbing his face. Yeah. And saying, listen to me. Look at me. Pay attention to me. And that's what this is doing for me. Yeah. My Abba has got my attention and I've got his. Yes. That is what your Heavenly Father wants for each one of you. Amen. Yeah. And I feel like I need to speak to the broken ones. Because you don't even feel the worth to crawl up on his lap. To just sit maybe cross-legged in front of the throne is as far as you can get. And he showed me a long time ago when I was in that position. But I came with a warrior's heart. I thought I was being big, right? And I knelt before his throne, but I was heartbroken. And I could not receive the love I needed. And I expected him to reach his hand down and touch my head. And do you know what he did? He slipped off the throne and he came and he sat beside me. You see, your God is not too prideful of a God to come to where you are. So for those of you who cannot crawl up into the lap, he brings his lap to you. Amen. And he puts his arms around you. And he says, all those things that have been spoken about the others are true for you. They're true for you. down, I bow low, I'll just, I'll get down on my face in humbleness and just just fall on his mercy to at least allow me to be under his protection as a servant. And that would have been enough. That would have been enough for the son. For the son, that would have been enough, but it wasn't enough, enough for the father. father. It wasn't enough for the father, because the father Hallelujah. had a son who was back. Son, there was that no place other than at the Father's table was going to be for that son. And it just occurred to me both sons were lost. Yes, yes, yeah. We've always understood that prodigal parable is one was right and one was wrong. Both sons were lost, and that is why that older son had not gotten to have a party yet because he was not back yet even though he was in his father's presence. And that is why we war for our brothers and sisters, because there are brothers and sisters who are sitting in his presence every Sunday morning, and they have no clue what they really have and who they really are. The younger son went out and searched for his identity, searched the entire world for his identity. And the older son toiled in the dirt for his identity. All either one of them had to do was just listen to to open up and listen to their father. Right? He tried. He tried. The younger son wasn't lost because he went off to another land. He wasn't lost because he squandered all the wealth. He wasn't lost because he ate, ate drink, and was merry. He was lost because he didn't understand who he was in the father's house. And that's the same reason the older brother was lost. So I feel as a corporate repentance, 
We need to ask forgiveness for judging the prodigals. Yes, yes. We, Father, we ask forgiveness for our judgment against your prodigals, thinking they were the ones we, that were lost when we were just as lost because we knew not who we were. Forgive us for that, Father. And replace that with the intense love of your heart for each person. Not counting judgment, but understanding because we've been there. And maybe are still there in certain ways. So thank you. Thank you, Father, that you really sins are forgiven over us. And I just hear the Father saying that we ask the already the children of God and as the bride of Christ that we should go ahead and start the party for the prodigals so they can hear the celebration and hear the sound and know where to come home to. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. They should start the party. Because yeah. I've always looked at that story of the prodigal or of the father, I should say. The story of the father. Yeah. What, is, what hurts the most reading that is at the end of the story the son who squandered everything and went off. He understood his identity at the end. What's sad is that the older, the older son still didn't understand his identity. Identity but for so long, that's who I identified with. I, I hadn't wandered off. I had all these friends I had and wandered off. And this and that, and I had always been toiling in the dirt. Father God, we lean on you Amen. to show us our true identity as sons of God. That we can walk in that identity. That we can love in that identity. That we can love our brothers and sisters. And we can fully love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the word. Thank you for your spirit. We thank you that you are a loving Father. Now let us go out from this place to the Releasing the breath, touching with your hands, and loving with your heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. Kevin, the other thing I learned this morning, and I wasn't going to say anything, but it keeps rolling around. When BJ was talking about the Holy Spirit is our defense attorney, and then you said, God is the judge. That leaves Jesus to be the witness. That's right. I never put that together before. I knew all those things, but I never put them together. That I'm secure. Amen. I am secure. I've got the witness. I've got the best attorney, and I know the judge. <laughs> they are for me. They are for me. So thank you guys for being here. Thank you. It was a good word today. And we all said, Amen. Amen. Amen.